What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at no More Parties. And today's video, I'm going to be going round by round through Dynasty Rookie Drafts, identifying the best values in each round so you can maximize the picks that you have throughout the draft. I think that's probably all the, uh, the introduction I need, so let's do it. <laughs> In the first round of Dynasty Rookie Drafts right now, this is super flex. The first best value in the first round, I think, is Kenny Pickett. And I looked at three different ADP sources. One of them, DLF, Dynasty League Football. Um, the second one, Keep Trade Cut, which is an ADP, but it's like crowdsourced rankings. And then third is Sleeper. And on those three formats, Kenny Pickett is currently going at the 108, 109, and 107. And I think he's good value because he was a quarterback taken in the first round and we just never know about these quarterbacks like everybody thought that Baker Mayfield was going to be great like he was incredibly efficient in college we all thought Daniel Jones would be absolutely terrible and he's been okay we all thought Josh Allen would suck and he's been great like so many examples that just show that we don't know anything when it comes to these these quarterback evaluations and while I don't personally think Kenny Pickett is that good like it took him five years to even become anything really in college there's the hand size thing there's the fact that you you know, he was the first quarterback off the board, but he fell to, you know, the early 20s. I don't think he's probably that good, but he's a first round quarterback and that's good enough to say, okay, then he's probably a good pick wherever he's going in the first round of Dynasty rookie drafts. And he's going in the second half of the first round of Dynasty rookie drafts. So he's a first round pick and we just never know about those guys. Quarterbacks typically retain value pretty well um, in fantasy football. Like Trey Lance hasn't lost a lot of value. You know, Kenny Pickett could play poorly and, you know, as long as he keeps the starting job and Pittsburgh just doesn't give up on him after a year, like he's still going to hold value in fantasy leagues. And that's on top of him having like some sneaky rushing value and especially that he has great weapons in Pittsburgh. Um, that offensive line still kind of is what it is, but they got, you know, Pat Firemuth, Deontay Johnson, uh, Chase Claypool, George Pickens. They, they got dudes here. They got Najee Harris to hand the ball off to. They have, this is about as good a situation as far as like offensive weaponry that you could ask a rookie quarterback to step into. And I think Kenny Pickett would be really a good pick in the first round anywhere outside of Brees Hall. Like I'm not taking him at the 102, but like, especially after that, after that first tier of, um, you know, Hall and then the three wide receivers, as soon as the 105, like Kenny Pickett is a great pick as far as I can tell. And he's going, you know, later than that in most drafts. The second a uh, value pick in the first round is Chris Olave with the Saints and on those three formats he's going 107 107 108 so kind of right there with uh with Kenny Pickett at the 107 108 spot and he's a value because in the NFL draft he was taken ahead of both Jamison Williams and Traylon Burks he's being drafted behind them now in dynasty rookie drafts he's playing with a quarterback in Jameis Winston who a has an arm b we know likes to sling it and C is arguably better than the quarterbacks of all of the wide receivers who were taken ahead of Chris Olave. Like Jamison Williams has Jared Goff. Uh, Garrett Wilson has Zach Wilson, who might be good, might be bad. We don't we don't really know yet. Drake London has who Marcus Mariota. He's just pretty average at this point. He's probably a value in fantasy himself, but he's not better than Jameis Winston, I don't think. So those are the three guys taken ahead of Chris Olave in the NFL draft. And then you know Traylon Burks has has Ryan Tannehill. Like he's fairly comparable to Jameis. Jameis Winston, like I wouldn't argue with anybody who thinks that Jameis Winston is better than Ryan Tannehill, especially for fantasy purposes, given that Jameis Winston's like a, he's a gunslinger. And then as far as like the, the, the target competition goes in New Orleans, we've got Michael Thomas and then pretty much nobody else. We got like Marcus Calloway, Traquan Smith, guys like that. If Michael Thomas doesn't play, there's a pretty good chance, I would say, that Chris Olave is the wide receiver one in this offense. And even if Michael Thomas is playing and is healthy, Chris Olave still has less target competition in New Orleans this season than he had in the last couple of years at Ohio State, like especially last season. Garrett Wilson, Jackson Smith, there's Michael Thomas and nobody else. Chris Olave is going to get peppered with targets if Thomas doesn't play. He's going to be the number two option in this passing game if Michael Thomas does play, maybe behind Alvin Kamara. But Alvin Kamara himself is gone, you know, maybe for the first six weeks. So it could be the Chris Olave show in New Orleans. I I understand what separates those those big three from Olave, those big three wide receivers, uh, Burks, Wilson, London from Olave. And I'm not necessarily making a case here that Olave needs to be like pulled up to their range, but he's a great pick at the 107. He's a great pick at the 108. He's just a good value right now. 
Um, in the second round, um, the first value I want to talk about is Jahan Dotson, who is going at the 201 according to DLF, the 202 according to Sleeper, and at the 112 according to Keep Trade Cut. So he's right there on the um, fringe first, second round, generally going in the early second round. And he was taken ahead of Traylon Burks, Christian Watson, George Pickens, and Sky Moore in the NFL draft. All of those guys are being taken ahead of him in rookie drafts. And I would kind of understand that if like Dotson was one of these, like if John Mechie was taken in the first round and those guys were being taken ahead of him. It's like, okay, John Mechie just like doesn't have a good profile at all. But Jahan Dotson had, you know, a 50th percentile breakout age. So decent there. 90th percentile college dominator. I know he's not an early declare, but like he was a good college player who was good from a relatively young age at a powerhouse program in Penn State. Like he was a good college player, solid analytical profile. He has nice film. You know, he can run routes. He's fast. He can he can go up and get the ball. Like, this is a good player taken in the middle of the first round. And yeah, it was probably a reach, especially given, you know, our expectations about where a lot of these guys were going to go. I don't think anybody expected Jahan Dawson to go at the 116. But he, he did. And he was taken ahead of... Those four guys who are now going ahead of him in rookie drafts. His main competition in Washington is Terry McLaurin, who is in the last year of his deal. I would kind of assume, I guess, that they extend him, but the other target competition on the team is Diami Brown and Curtis Samuel, and like, yeah, we want Curtis Samuel to be better than he is, but he's not better than he is, and Diami Brown didn't do much last season, like, there is, you know, a chance that Jahan Dawson steps into this offense, and it's just immediately the number two option in the passing game, and the quarterback situation isn't great, blah, 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 all of that, but the point here is that this is a wide receiver taken in the middle of the first round in the NFL draft with a good profile who is now being taken behind several players who have comparable profiles and were taken later than him in the NFL draft. Like, this is just a good value in the early second round. I'm pushing the button on Jahan Dotson at like the 201 all day. Um, the next value I want to talk about in the second round is Damian Pierce, who is going at the 210 according to DLF the 203 according to Keep Trade Cut, and the 206 according to Sleeper. I would probably prefer, I mean, obviously I'd prefer to get him later, but like, I am more on board with him going at like the 203. That's not necessarily a value, but in the in the back end of the, of the second round, you know, 210, even 206, I think Damian Pierce is a value there because A, he's got workhorse size and a workhorse skill set. Like he's 220 pounds, he's like 5'9", so he's a rocked up dude. He catches passes well. He was used dynamically there at Florida. He was one of the most efficient running backs in this draft class on the ground. We know he was underutilized at school. And he, then he got solid draft capital, like early day three, which, you know, isn't great, but it's, you know, he didn't fall to the sixth round like Keonta Ingram. But this is a wide open depth chart in Houston. Like I was interested in Marlon Mack pre-draft because he was like the best, highest upside player on a wide open depth chart. Damian Pierce steps in and is that dude now. He's better than Isaiah Spill. Like, he just simply is. He's He was a better runner in college, more dynamically used as a receiver, better athlete than Spiller. He was taken earlier in the NFL draft than Spiller was. He has less competition on his NFL team in his NFL backfield than Spiller does. And he's being drafted after Isaiah Spiller on Sleeper and over at DLF. Like, it doesn't make any sense that Damian Pierce is still not regarded higher than Isaiah Spiller because his profile is better, he was taken earlier, and he's in a, a better situation for seeing early volume, like early high-end volume. Like, Damian Pierce is a value in the in the late half of the second round of rookie drafts. Should definitely be taken ahead of Isaiah Spiller. Uh, the best value picks in the third round, the first one is Tyrion Davis-Price, who is going at the 305, 306, and 306 on those three formats. And he's a value because he was a third-round pick, uh, taken ahead of Tyler Algier, Brian Robinson, Zamir White, Damian Pierce, Isaiah Spiller, taken ahead of all of those guys, being drafted after all of them in Dynasty Rookie Drafts, and he's fast, he ran 4-4 in the 40, and he was an efficient runner in college. His relative success rate is like 10.7%, which means given, um, you know, the down and distance situations he was carrying the ball in, given the box counts he was seeing, he was succeeding on nearly 11% more of his carries than the other running backs at LSU, which is like a pretty talented group. You know, LSU gets, gets nice recruits at running back. His relative success rate was the highest of any running back in this class, and his box-adjusted efficiency rating, which looks at, you know, what is the per carry output for Davis Price worth 
versus the per carry output of all the other LSU running backs, given the box counts that he's seeing. So like considering that he's seeing higher box counts than them, how much is he doing on a per touch basis? The average carry for, for TDP was worth 112% the output of the other LSU running backs, given the box counts he was seeing, which isn't great in like the grand scheme of like NFL quality running backs. But given that he was playing with talented guys at LSU and was the lead back, that's pretty solid. Like he was producing more on a per carry level than talented running backs at a really quality program in both 2020 and 2021 while succeeding on a much greater percentage of his carries than those guys were. Like he's a fast dude, good instincts at the line of scrimmage, succeeding consistently on his carries, and he got drafted to the 49ers. And I know that everybody loves Elijah Mitchell and everybody was burned by Trey Sermon last year, but like you you have to forget about Trey Sermon. Not about him as a player necessarily, but about the Trey Sermon experience in rookie drafts last year. Like Tyrion Davis Price is a different player. This is a different year. And it's just rinse and repeat with these San Francisco running backs, and I don't know that Davis Price steps in and like beats out Elijah Mitchell for this job, but he was taken in the third round to a team that just churns through running backs every single season and turns every single guy who gets touches into an RB2 or RB1 level fantasy producer. Like, there's no reason to not be interested in Tyrion Davis Price unless you're just so bought into a fifth round pick in Elijah Mitchell who had one quality season on a team that sees everybody have one quality season, that then you're blinded to the draft capital given to this decent player in Tyrion Davis Price. Like, he's just being taken too low. Um, the next guy I want to talk about is Tyquan Thornton out of Baylor, ended up in New England. At DLF, he's being taken at the 310, keep trade cut, the 308, sleeper, the 308. And he's a value because he was a second round pick in the NFL draft, ahead of George Pickens, ahead of Alec Pierce, ahead of Sky Moore, ahead of Vilas Jones, ahead of Jalen Tolbert, ahead of David Bell, ahead of Khalil Shakir, and every single one of those guys is being taken ahead of him in Dynasty Rookie Drafts. Like I said with uh, with Jahan Dotson, like, I would get it if Tyquan Thornton just had a terrible profile. Like, Velas Jones was taken ahead a lot of a lot of that group as well. His profile's terrible. He's, he's 25 years old already. He didn't break out until, like, year six in college. Like, he, he was a bad college player with a bad prospect profile. It makes sense for us to push him down even though he was overdrafted. And while Tyquan Thornton might have been overdrafted, a little bit. His profile is good. 60th percentile breakout age, 76th percentile college dominator rating. He runs a 428. Like the dude can fly. He's got decent size. He's a little skinny, but he's long. And he's on a weak depth chart in New England with no field stretcher. Like they got Devontae Parker, who presumably is the is the lead receiver is the X. Nelson Aguilar can do a little bit of everything. Um, then they got like Kendrick Bourne. Jacoby Myers is a good player. This isn't the Bengals depth chart. Like Tyquan Thornton is stepping in here. None of those guys can play the pure field stretcher role like he can. We've seen Mac Jones succeed with Henry Ruggs, Jalen Waddle, these, these speed guys before at Alabama. Tyquan Thornton was a second round pick with a solid prospect profile on a, on a weak depth chart. Like, why is he falling to the late third round behind guys like Velas Jones, you know, Khalil Shakir, who was taken in the fifth round? It doesn't make any sense. The best value picks in the fourth round. Um, the first one is Greg Dulcich, who is currently going at the 405 at DLF, the 402 on sleeper, and the 312 at keep trade cut. And the case for him is pretty simple. He got third round capital, which is solid for a tight end. He's on a good offense with some weapons and Russell Wilson now leading the show. He's a good athlete. We know that athleticism is more predictive for tight ends than really anything else and for any other position. But he was also productive in college. 70th percentile breakout age, 83rd percentile dominator rating. He does have Albert Okuabunum ahead of him on the depth chart right now. And we think that Alberto is better than Greg Dulcich. Like, I I don't disagree with that. I think Alberto is probably better than Greg Dulcich. But we haven't seen Alberto have long stretches as the lead tight end in this offense either. So it's not like he's some sort of, you know, super established proven guy. The odds that Greg Dulcich is better than Alberto are greater than zero. I'm not predicting that. But Albert O is also, you know, his contract is up after 2023. We're not drafting our tight ends in rookie drafts, expecting them to contribute like in their first season in the NFL. And so the fact that Albert O is ahead of him doesn't really move the needle for me because Albert O might be gone in two years by the time we expect Dulcich to start contributing anyway. Like, why do we care about Albert O? So Dulcich is a good pick in the fourth round. He's just a good player, good move tight end on a good offense. And, and, and that's all you can really hope for in the fourth round. That's, you know, smashing the button on that. And then the next guy in the fourth round is Keontae Ingram out of USC, ended up in Arizona in the sixth round, being taken at the 401 per DLF, the 502 per keep trade cut, and the 312 on sleeper. So we got, you know, a wide range here for him, but 
kind of settles. Um, the average of that is basically in the fourth round. So the case for Ingram is that he's got workhorse size and a workhorse skill set. You know, similar to Damian Pierce, he's right around 220 pounds. He's faster um, than Pierce. He's, you know, four, five, three in the 40. He's not a big play guy, but, you know, he was a consistent runner as well. Um, he catches passes. And this is a weak depth chart. Like James Conner was really productive in fantasy last year, but he scored a ton of touchdowns. Um, he wasn't actually good on a per touch basis. He was actually the least efficient lead back in the entire league in 2021. And then and Chase Edmonds is gone. I like Eno Benjamin, and I think a lot of there are a lot of Eno Benjamin fans out there, but we have no idea if Eno Benjamin is anything. He really hasn't done anything thus far in his NFL career. And while he's like hypothetically good and fun, we don't actually know if he's good or fun. And so Keontae Ingram, for my money, is the most talented player in this backfield like right now. He's better than James Conner right now. He's better than Eno Benjamin right now. He has, you know, a, a skill set that is kind of like the two of them converged. The the rushing ability of like a prime James Conner with that size. He's a, he's a decent pass catcher. And this is a high-powered offense. Like they got a running quarterback in Kyler Murray. They have weapons on the outside. And while I don't think it's probably more likely than not that Keontae Ingram ends up as the lead back in this offense before the year is out, I think it's at least possible. And if James Conner gets hurt, I don't think they're going to give Eno Benjamin the keys to this offense. I think it's going to be Keonta Ingram stepping into a larger role with Eno Benjamin still hanging around as like the third down back, um, you know, complimentary guy, just playing a role. So I think Keonta Ingram has really high upside in this offense. James Conner hasn't been good. He's getting up there in age. Who knows if he stays healthy? Who knows if Ingram just doesn't outplay him straight up and just take that job? Um, the best value picks in the fifth round are Snoop Connor, um, who is going at the 505, 508, and 504 on our three formats there. And the case for him is pretty simple. Like, he's got workhorse size at 222 pounds. He was an efficient runner in college, um, 51st percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, which, like, 51st percentile is not incredible, but that is self-explanatory. Like, it's it's above average. So he was decent in college. His 97.1% true catch rate is number one in this entire running back class. I don't think he's a great pass catcher, but he at least has decent hands and can run the ball effectively. But the case for him really is that this is a fragile depth chart. Like, Travis Etienne is coming off this Liz Frank injury. I'm optimistic about him, but there you know, there is injury risk. James Robinson coming off an Achilles injury. Who knows if he's ever healthy again? Who knows if he, you know, is ready at the beginning of the season? I like Raquel Armstead behind those guys, but they took Snoop Connor. I don't know that they feel comfortable with Raquel Armstead, and it's very possible that Snoop Connor just jumps him on the depth chart and is the number two back in week one behind Travis Etienne. And if Etienne gets hurt again, reaggravates that injury, whatever, Snoop Connor could step into a role as the lead runner on a team that you know, probably isn't very good, but being the lead runner on an NFL team is definitely worth a fifth round pick in a rookie draft. Like he's going to be a handcuff. It's very likely that he could be just the handcuff in this offense and he's going to be a boring handcuff, but a handcuff behind a lead back in Travis Etienne carries value. And, and that's why you got to be interested in Snoop Connor in the fifth round. Um, the next guy I want to talk about is Kevin Harris, who's going at the 508 on DLF, um, the 412 at Keep Trade Cut, and the 506 on Sleeper. He ended up in New England, which is obviously like a crowded depth chart there at running back. They took Pierre Strong a little bit ahead of him in the draft, but this is just like a talent upside play. Kevin Harris was a great college runner, 46% sophomore dominator rating as a, as a true two-year player in the SEC. That's the best number in the SEC going at least back, you know, 15 years, if not further. And he was very efficient. His box adjusted efficiency rating in 2020 when he was healthy, 90th percentile, like just incredibly efficient. He broke his back, had surgery, was recovering from that this last season, but his relative success rate last year was 94th percentile. And so while he wasn't still creating big plays to the degree that he was the year before, um, he was, you know, lost a little bit of his juice while recovering from the injury. He was still navigating the line of scrimmage and creating positive outcomes on his carries a lot more often than the other guys at South Carolina, a group that included like Marshawn Lloyd, Saquandre White, like that was a talented running back room that Kevin Harris was outdoing on the ground in both 2020 and 2021. Um, and his career numbers in box adjusted efficiency rating and relative success rate are in the 67th and 62nd percentiles. And he lands on a depth chart in New England that, yeah, is pretty crowded, but it's also not that like stocked with high-end talent. Like Damian Harris is fine. 
Ramondre Stevenson is fine. Pierre Strong is a dynamic player who, you know, who knows what he is in the NFL. He's a, he's probably fine, but he doesn't play the same role that Kevin Harris plays. James White is over the hill. J.J. Taylor hasn't been what they wanted him to be. This is a fairly ascendable depth chart if Kevin Harris is healthy and can prove to be that player we saw him be as a sophomore. And Damian Harris might be gone after 2022. And at that point, maybe this depth chart is just wide open again. Maybe Ramondre Stevenson steps into the lead role. Maybe Kevin Harris takes over. Who knows what happens? But I think Kevin Harris is a really talented guy who is just dirt cheap in rookie drafts. And I think you just, you want to fill the back of your roster, the bottom of your roster with talented dudes who could pop if they get an opportunity. And that's Kevin Harris. That's the end of rookie drafts. Like most of them don't go longer than five rounds. I got two guys here who are the best value UDFAs that I've identified. Um, guys who just aren't really even going in rookie drafts on keep trade cut. Kennedy Brooks is going at the 507. He's not even listed at DLF, not even listed at sleeper, you know, outside the top, like 55, 60 guys in rookie drafts right now. But Kennedy Brooks is just like a really good runner at Oklahoma. 70th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, 82nd percentile relative success rate, 81st percentile breakaway conversion rate, 94th percentile missed tackles forced per attempt. So he was efficient, consistent, dynamic in the open field, and breaks a ton of tackles. Like, I don't know what else we want from our running backs as far as what they're doing on a per-touch basis. And he was wasn't just productive on a per touch basis. He was just productive period at Oklahoma. He sat out the COVID year in 2020, but other than that, he went three for three with 1000 yard rushing seasons. And this depth chart with the Eagles is full of just pass catching types. Like Miles Sanders is completely blah as a between the tackles runner. He's not really that good as a receiver either. He's just kind of like an athletic dude. And then they got like Boston Scott, Kenneth Gainwell, Jason Huntley. Like they have all these guys who fill roles as pass catchers. But in the past, they've had like LeGarrette Blunt, Jay Jai. Jordan Howard filled this like two down pounder role that's been productive and you know like a a key part of this offense. They don't have a guy on the roster right now outside of Kennedy Brooks who fills that spot well. And Kennedy Brooks isn't just like a guy who can do that. He's a guy who can do that well, given what we saw from him at Oklahoma. So I'm very interested in him after rookie drafts end. Um, I'd even be willing to take him like in the fifth round if I got multiple shots there. The next guy I want to talk about is Abram Smith going at the 5'11 on keep trade cut, also not listed on sleeper or DLF. And this is a play where like this is a potentially open depth chart. And Abram Smith was a good player in college. Like there's Alvin Kamara at the top of the Saints depth chart. And then there's over the hill Mark Ingram. We got three dudes in Dwayne Washington, Josh Adams, and Tony Jones, who are just total just dudes, like total jags. Abram Smith, it's not out of the question that he just like comes in here, ascends past those three. There's, it's not out of the question that he's just got more juice than, than Mark Ingram at this point. And even if he doesn't have more juice than Mark Ingram at this point, if Alvin Kamara is suspended for the first six games of this next season, they like to use this like one, two punch at running back. Maybe it's Ingram and Abram Smith. Maybe it's Abram Smith and Ingram. Like who, who knows? But Abram Smith led the big 12 in rushing last year. He was efficient on a per touch basis and he played defense early in his career. And so these guys at the end of the roster, you know, Tony Jones, Josh Adams versus Abram Smith. If Abram Smith is just as good a runner as they are, which I think he is, but he also offers utility on special teams and as, you know, a versatile contributor who can, you know, step in on defense, you know, in, a, in an emergency type situation. Like he carries that extra value from having experience on defense, on special teams that guys like Josh Adams and Tony Jones just don't offer. And so when it comes down to final cuts, if I'm the head coach of the Saints, like I'm leaning towards a guy who offers that versatility, which gives him a chance to make the team and then establish himself on this running back on this running back depth chart. And then let's just see what happens. Like Abram Smith could have a week one role as an undrafted free agent on a New Orleans Saints team that uses two running backs. And so those are the guys I got. Best value picks in each round of a rookie draft. Let me know what you think. Let me know the other what I don't know what the fuck. Just make a comment. Tell me I'm an idiot. Yeah. Thanks for sticking around, watching the video, hit like, hit subscribe. I don't know what the next video is, but I'm sure I'll come up with a great idea. Until then, have a great week. Peace.